Great. Thanks very much, Andy, for the invitation and welcome to everybody. I guess I should start by saying we planned this presentation a few months ago, and I think none of us really quite imagined kind of how things will be changed. So I just wanted to say, you know, my best to everybody out there to look after yourselves and look after those around you. This is kind of a very strange time, and I know it's very stressful here in our university and many other places. So I'm going to start and talk about MT. And my goal in this presentation is to give an overview for those of you who are not working in the subject. And <clears throat> we'll kind of start off by seeing how MT can image the subsurface of the Earth. So we'll see that the energy source is things like the aurora, powerful signals that occur in the Earth's magnetic field. And by measuring them on the ground at a number of points, we can get an image of the subsurface. So this is an image that's been quite widely seen before of the San Andreas Fault. And this was work we did in the, in the early 1990s. And this is about the time, I think, when other geoscientists were beginning to take MT more seriously. And I still remember talking to Mark Zoback at Parkfield where this image was made. And he was kind of a big fan because this helped us really look at the San Andreas Fault. And his opinion was, well, MT used to say things like the resistivity in the east of Oklahoma is more than in the west. And that might be true, but it wasn't the most useful piece of information. So my goal is to talk to the non-MT people. My apologies to the MT experts online if I occasionally simplify things beyond what you think is reasonable. So just where we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about MT in four distinct ways. We'll start off by talking about what controls the resistivity of rocks. And you will see from this color bar, the resistivity the property we measure varies by orders of magnitudes from a rock which is partially molten or water saturated to dry. Then we'll talk a little bit about the physics of MT. And this has minimal equations. If you'd like more equations and a more mathematical approach, I would be more than willing to point you in the direction of something a little bit more technical. Then we'll kind of walk through the workflow that we use <coughs> for, for MT and talk about how we analyze data. And then finally, we'll talk about applications. And I just picked out a few of them and just to try and illustrate where MT is going and how it has become a more useful method. Well, as we go through, you'll probably notice I sometimes talk about resistivity and sometimes conductivity of the Earth. They're obviously just reciprocals. And I know it's confusing that MT people sometimes use both. Likewise, we'll talk about frequency of the signal and we'll also talk about period. So again, they're just reciprocals. And again, I, I do hear a lot from people that it's confusing that we don't all use exactly the same terminology. So to get started, let's talk about what controls the resistivity of earth materials. And we'll start with pure materials, i.e. minerals, and consider on the atomic level what helps electric current flow in this sort of material. So you can see here, we've got a, a cylinder, we've got electric current flowing, and the current is carried by some charge carriers. And it's quite straightforward to show that the resistivity depends on one over the number of charge carriers per cubic meter, the charge on each, and something we're gonna call the mobility. That is how easily these carriers can move. So no surprises if you have lots of charge carriers and they're very mobile, that's gonna make the resistivity low. So we can kind of look at just a few token earth elements and minerals. And if we look at copper, copper has electronic conduction. And that has lots of charge carriers, the highly mobile. And copper has a resistivity around 10 to the minus eight ohm meters. Sulfide minerals, such as pyrite here, iron sulfide, they kind of have a lot of ions and other mechanisms of semiconduction, and they typically have a resistivity that is pretty low, 10 to the minus five ohm meters. And in fact, a lot of mineral exploration use of, of geophysics, EM geophysics uses this fact. Well, if we move over to silicate minerals, they tend to have a lattice structure and the charge carriers aren't really abundant and they're not really able to move easily through the material. So olivine shown here, has a resistivity up in 10 to the five, 10 to the four ohm meters. And it's really just imperfections often in the crystal that allow the electric current to flow. But right up at the end, diamond has a very, very strong tetrahedral covalent bonded structure. 
and basically has almost no charge carriers if it's pure. So a pure diamond is an insulator resistivity of 10 to the 18 ohm meters. So you can see for the pure materials, we have a huge range of resistivities. But most interesting earth materials are mixtures. So if we consider what aqueous fluids look like, for example, salt water here in a hot spring, we see that the main charge carriers are going to be the ions which are dissolved. So the water molecules don't have a net electric charge and don't carry electricity. So shown here, as we increase the salinity, grams per liter of the brine, we see that the conductivity in Siemens per meter rises. So this makes it immediately, you can see, if you measure the conductivity of a fluid, you can estimate its salinity. Well, this is obviously important in geothermal exploration, and there is a temperature variation as well. So these are figures that were compiled by Greg Usher in 2000, and you can see that as the salinity increases, the conductivity increases. But also as we increase the temperature, the conductivity increases because we're making it easier for these ions to move through the liquid. So that's brines, aqueous fluids. Another fluid that's really interesting in a lot of geophysical studies is molten rock or magma. And in magma, once it's molten, we have a number of ions that can be potential charge carriers. The silica tetrahedra, SiO4, is a potential carrier, but it's very large and it's really not very mobile. And if it's polymerized into chains, it's even less so. So in most silicate melts, we find that it's the ions, the sodium and perhaps the potassium and calcium ions that are quite effective charge carriers. And in the good old days of MT in the 1980s and 90s, we really didn't have any information on how the chemistry of a melt affected the conductivity or the resistivity. But thanks to a lot of lab experiments in recent years and decades, and a very good compilation here by Anne Pommier in the SIGMELTS program, we can actually now understand a little bit more about how the resistivity of a melt varies with its composition. So this is some data we'll look at a bit later on that I used to interpret a study at a volcano in Bolivia. And it kind of shows that for a silicate melt, it's andesite, 60% silica, 980 centigrade, and kind of, you know, uh, 375 megapascals. This is what happens if you vary the water concentration, and this is the sodium concentration. So you can see that increasing water lowers the resistivity, and likewise, increasing the sodium, adding charge carriers, also increases the conductivity, or decreases the resistivity. So this really helps you interpret models that are going to be derived by MT. Without this sort of lab information, it's really very difficult to go from a resistivity to something about uh, you know, a melt. So just remind, this is the pure liquid. In a moment, we're going to consider what happens when we have a mixture of rock grains and melt. So here we are looking now inside a, a molten rock. This is a very typical two-phase system. And we've got the mineral grains, and they're generally resistive. They're feldspars, they're quartzes, things like that. They don't really conduct electricity very well. But in between them, we have a liquid. And this model would work for melt, or it would also work for water, aqueous fluids, brine, that you might find, for example, in, a, in an aquifer. So what we find here is that the resistivity is the average of material which is high and low. And there's a number of equations out there that you can use to do this averaging. And Archie's law is one of the good ones for that. Archie's is a mixing law, and it calculates with this equation here, the bulk resistivity is the fluid resistivity times the porosity or the melt fraction times this exponent M. And M is sort of where the permeability comes in. So we can kind of see here on this graph, as we increase the melt fraction, we are decreasing the bulk resistivity. And as we vary M, we can see that there is indeed quite a large effect from changing the interconnection of the pore space. So Archie's law is just one of a number of equations that have been developed and are used. And it reproduces the average, the bulk resistivity of a mixture. 
high resistivity grains, low resistivity liquid. So let's kind of summarize now what we've talked about earth resistivity, materials of earth resistivity. So on this spectrum, we can see that the highest resistivity materials tend to be crystalline igneous rocks. There are very few charge carriers in them. If we look at sedimentary rocks, we see a more intermediate resistivity. This is controlled usually by the water in the pore space, the salinity of that water, the amount of it, the porosity, and also the permeability. And then we get down to the bottom, there's a number of earth materials that have really quite low resistivity values. Brines, for example. Partial melt can also do this. And it's also worth noting, as we'll see in geothermal applications, that clay alteration can also produce a low resistivity. So I use the color bar this way around. Hot colors imply low resistivity and fluids. Cold colors are high resistivity. An only important point to make is, if you're seeing a resistivity down here, this is non-unique. That is to say, there are multiple explanations for that resistivity value. And you need to use other data to really distinguish between the options. It could be partial melt, it could be clay, it could be brines. And it's really important to address that with other data. So also melt resistivity we know really depends on composition. And a few slides back, we saw that there's actually quite a wide range on where melt might show up on this color scale. And that depends on the water, the sodium, the temperature, quite a few factors. So sticking with that color bar, the next question is to ask ourselves, well, okay, how do we actually measure the resistivity of the earth in a geophysical geological survey? So well logging, if you're familiar with that technique, after you've drilled a well, you lower a sensitive instrument down the hole, and that measures the resistivity in the vicinity of the borehole. But obviously it's not measuring regional structure and you have to have actually already drilled a well for this to be, to be possible. And often you're doing a geophysical survey to avoid the cost of drilling. So this is useful, but it doesn't really map out regional structure. DC resistivity, perhaps people are familiar with, this is a geophysical technique where you inject electric current through a pair of electrodes, flows through the earth, and you measure the voltage over more electrodes, and you can measure the resistivity. This works very well near surface, but the depth is limited by the distance between your dipoles. And if you're looking to measure kilometers or tens of kilometers, this method is not really practical. So electromagnetic methods are quite different to resistivity methods because they basically use EM waves or low frequency radio signals. And these have electric and magnetic fields associated with them. And there are quite a wide range of them. Some of them are ground-based, others are airborne. You use a helicopter or an aircraft. And in others, you actually have to generate a signal. So that requires a transmitter. But all of those methods are capable of imaging probably down to one or two kilometers max. So if you want to use a method to look for resistivity more than those depths, Really, the only viable technique we have is MT, magnetotellurics. That is using natural signals. We'll talk about where they come from in a moment. And the great thing about EM methods is the depth of penetration in the Earth is controlled by the frequency of the signal. So by simply changing your frequency, you can change the depth of exploration. That's much more convenient than DC resistivity, where you have to change dipole lengths to look deeper. So this is the only slide really with any equations in it, and I want to use it to explain how MT measures the resistivity of the Earth. So what we're seeing here is the blue waves are electromagnetic waves that are coming from space or from the atmosphere, and they're being reflected at the Earth's surface to give the red wave. Most of the energy bounces back, but a small amount of it makes it into the Earth, shown by the black line here. And you'll actually notice there is a fundamental change in the physical behavior between the atmosphere, where the signal is a wave, and the Earth, where it is a diffusion. So a key equation in MT is this one here, we call the skin depth, the depth of penetration. And this depth is how deep the signal goes. And it depends on one over the square root of conductivity times frequency. So from this equation, you can work out how deep the signal is going. 
And by comparing these two signals, which have 10 and 40 hertz frequencies, you can see that the high frequency signal does not travel as far in the Earth as you would expect. So the idea with MT is you measure natural EM waves at the surface. And by looking at multiple frequencies, you can get an idea of signals that are traveling to different depths in the Earth. But the other key part of MT, and I'd be happy to point people who are interested to a description of the mathematics, is that we can measure something called apparent resistivity. And this is, if you like, an average resistivity of the Earth where it's being measured. And it's calculated from electric and magnetic field measurements. So your instrument has to sit at the surface, measure the electric and magnetic field, and then you can simply calculate this apparent resistivity. And if you do this at multiple frequencies, you can quite easily get a variation of resistivity with depth in the Earth. So some of the advantages of MT compared to other EM methods, natural signals, you don't have to have the logistical and financial cost of running a transmitter. Most of the time in MT, we have plane waves, and that simplifies the analysis. That means the wave is uniform horizontally over quite large distances. And for deep exploration, MT is really the only method that can get down there to, to depths of more than a few kilometers. And if you lower the frequency enough, you can be looking down more than 100 kilometers. So let's just kind of solve the Ford problem, as we call it. Remember, a Ford problem in geophysics is you start with a resistivity model and you predict the data that you'll measure. So what we're going to do here is we're going to consider a two layer Earth, 10 and 100 ohm meters. And we're going to lower the frequency and we're going to look at this quantity we call apparent resistivity. So at the highest frequencies, the signals don't make it down into the lower layer. So the average resistivity is 10, i.e. the resistivity of the upper layer. And we plot them on what we call an apparent resistivity curve. And we always plot frequency decreasing to the right because as we decrease frequency, we're going deeper into the Earth. So as we lower the frequency enough that it starts to sample the lower layer, we see a rise in apparent resistivity. And that is an average of the two layers. And as the signal goes to lower and lower frequency, we start to sample more and more of the lower layer. So the apparent resistivity curve shows very nicely, we have an upper layer of 10 ohmmeters, a lower layer of 100, and we can see that there's a transition between them at a frequency, which is obviously related to the thickness of the layer. So that's a qualitative solution. Let's now look at a, an exact solution. The mathematics for this is not that complicated, but probably not appropriate for today. And in these figures, I'm gonna show the model on the right, and I'm gonna show a sounding curve, the predicted data on the left. So there's a quantity MT called the phase. I'm not gonna talk about that today. That's something that gives us additional information, and it's related quite closely to the apparent resistivity. So here we can see at the high frequencies, we're seeing the upper layer, we get this small bump of a resonance phenomena. And then at the lowest frequencies, the curve flattens out, corresponding to this lower layer down here. So let's put another layer in. Let's imagine we've got a finite thickness layer. What we can see now is the apparent resistivity starts at 100, it dips, and then it comes back. So you can look at the apparent resistivity curve and very easily see the three layers, one, two, Let's look at a different model now. We're going to stick with the same layer. It's uh, one kilometer thick, and we're going to move it deeper in the Earth. So what you can see is as we move this layer deeper, we still see the three layers in the apparent resistivity curve. Is first layer, second layer, third layer. But two things are happening as we move deeper in the Earth. The first is the, the the depth of the dip is getting less. And that is partly because the MT signal is measuring an average resistivity. So when you are back up at the surface, we're averaging one kilometer of 100 ohm meters with our target layer. And that produces quite a significant drop. It gets down towards 10. But as the layer goes deeper, 
there is more and more of the overlying material included in the average. So the average is closer to 100. And you can see as we go quite deep, this dip becomes really quite shallow. You'll also notice that this dip, which is characteristic of the, the conducting layer, is moving to lower frequency. We need a lower frequency to get down to that layer and be able to detect it. So this kind of shows quite well how MT can detect a layer in the Earth. And ultimately, we'll get to a point where in real data with noise, we're not going to be able to see that. Let's show you one more synthetic example of the Ford problem. And this is a really important thing in MT. MT is very good at measuring what we call the conductance of a layer. And the conductance is the product of conductivity and thickness. So here again, it's a familiar curve, layer one, layer two, layer three. And as we make the layer thinner, we'll notice an interesting thing is happening. I've chosen all of these models so that this layer has the same conductance. That is to say, this product is the same. And you'll see that all of these curves really become very similar. And this is showing you that when the layer becomes thin, and thin is defined as relative to its depth, you cannot separately get the conductivity and thickness but you can determine the product. So like any geophysical method, MT has some strengths and some weaknesses. And if you're aware of them, it's gonna be possible to work more effectively. So with MT, you can get the depth of the layer very well. And you can also get the conductance, the integrated conductivity of that layer. Well, let's just talk a little bit about things in two dimensions now. So we're still doing a Ford problem, which means we're gonna start with a model. And this will be a typical 1D model, such as we were just looking at. We've got layers, but it's the same in the X and the Y directions. So there's a few places where the Earth's resistivity structure is this simple, but this is not that common. Here is a 2D model. And in a 2D model, we have an invariant or strike direction. And in the Y direction, the model is varying. And what we see in electromagnetics is we have to separately consider the case where the electric current flows along parallel to the strike direction. And we also have to consider the case where the electric current flows across the structure. And people call these the TE mode, transverse electric, and this is the transverse magnetic mode. So we'll see some examples of these in a few moments. Well, if we're going out there and modern MT surveys now typically collect tens, hundreds, if not thousands of MT stations, we need a better way of presenting the data than just showing apparent resistivity curves. So in this survey, we've got 61 stations. It's a sedimentary basin. This is a pretty good approximation to Alberta. And the layer is getting deeper as we move along the transect. And what we see is at station one, the basin's shallow. We see the curve kicking up at relatively high frequency. Where the basin is deeper, we've got to go to a relatively low frequency before the resistivity that we measure, the apparent resistivity, begins to rise. So a very convenient way to plot 61 soundings is in what we call a pseudo section. And a pseudo section simply has each sounding represented vertically, and then we draw color contours to show the variations. And the great thing about pseudo sections is they give us a good impression of the data. And if you've got many stations, this is a very effective tool for visualization. Notice again, vertical scale is frequency. And as frequency decreases, we're seeing deeper in the earth because of the skin depth equation. And I think you'll agree that this pseudo section here gives us an impression of the true geological structure. But of course, what is pseudo about it is we don't have the true depth, we have frequency. So we need to do another processing step, modeling or inversion, to actually get a model out of the data. Well, just one more example of the MT Ford problem. And in this case, we've got a couple of prisms. So we've got a conductor and a resistor. And what we're seeing here in these pseudo sections is the TM mode, remember, this is electric current flowing across the profile. And as the current flows across, we're going to get electric charges building up on these surfaces. And it produces a pseudo section like this. You can see both the conductor 
and the resistor pretty well. Well, if the electric current flows in and out of the board, this is the TE mode, then we get quite a different pattern in the pseudo section. We see very clearly the conductor in the apparent resistivity, but the resistor is really not so clear because there is very little extra current generated by this feature. So in 2D, you are seeing very different images of the Earth depending on your current flow direction. And obviously together, you can get a complete image of the Earth. So now I'm gonna talk you through a set of stages for the kind of workflow involved in empty data analysis. And what I'm really gonna try and is highlight words that people use who work in this, just so that you can kind of follow what they're talking about. So we start off collecting data. We'll talk about the details in, in a moment. What we actually record with an MT instrument is a variation of the Earth's electromagnetic field with time. And we do that for electric field and magnetic field. Then we're gonna go through some following processing steps in a minute and end up with a model of the Earth. But let's start off just talking about those measurements. So an MT instrument is basically a sensitive radio receiver. We're measuring these EM waves coming from space. We measure the electric fields by measuring the large dipoles here, and they are typically a few hundred meters long. They're coupled to the ground with non-polarizing electrodes. You could use metal, but at low frequencies, you get corrosion effects between the metal and the ground. The magnetic fields, there's two ways of measuring them. This is what we call broadband MT, and this is what's used for looking at upper crustal, crustal structure, near surface to the mid-lower crust. And it's measuring 1,000 hertz to a 1,000 second period. And in this type of survey for magnetic fields, we use induction coils. These just basically have lots of turns of copper wire. And if you change the magnetic field, you get a voltage generated. So these are very sensitive, but they have to be buried to stop them moving around. Well, if you want to look deeper in the Earth, you have to measure lower frequencies. And long period MT is what we use for this. And in this case, we use a different type of magnetometer. You could use those induction coils, but they tend to be kind of a little bit more power hungry. And long period instruments with flux gates sit there and work really quite well. So this is an example of a long period instrument produced by, by NAROD Geophysics and both the US and Canadian communities use these instruments. Other commonly used ones come from Ukraine from, from the LEMI instrument you may have heard of. So again, we use similar electrodes. And for this in particular, getting high quality electrodes is really important. Making sure that your wires don't get bitten by animals in the course of a month is also kind of a big, big headache. Well, you can also do MT on the seafloor. And in some future talks in this series, we're gonna have some presentations about this. So seafloor MT instruments are in some ways quite similar to their on-land versions. These plastic arms contain the electrodes and the magnetic fields are measured by magnetometers and coils in the instrument. And these are dropped to the seafloor. The one feature that makes this a challenge is that the MT signals come from the atmosphere and when they transit through the seawater, the high frequencies get screened out. So you do lose high frequency signal when you're working at the seafloor. But there's an alternative technique, which is quite well developed now, controlled source EM, and that generates signals with a transmitter in this very, very quiet environment. Well, MT can also work easily on glaciers. And it's Phil Wanamaker who really started a lot of this in the US community. And the regular instruments can be used with a few adaptations. So the instrument here, you can see an Antarctic at Mount Erebus powered by a solar panel. And the coils are quite easy to install in snow and ice. It's quite easy to get a, you know, a, a decent hole to bury them. But where adaptations are needed on the ice comes with the electric fields, because obviously a porous pot electrode is simply gonna freeze if you put it into the, into the ice. So the technique that's widely used is we use the same induction coils and the electrodes are titanium sheets. So they're buried in the snow and they have a special amplifier to boost the signal. And just with that modification, standard MT instruments can, can, can easily be used in Antarctica and in other Arctic environments. So we'll just look a little bit now about some of the time series. What do the time series look like that you might measure? This is a high frequency lightning strike. And this is one second of data. 
So this gives us the high frequency part of our MT spectrum. Moving down to mid frequencies, you get a lot of oscillations occurring in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the solar wind. And these oscillations are almost sinusoidal at times, and they give good mid frequency band signals. Little spikes on these curves, they are the lightning strikes or spherics that we were just looking at. So this is the mid frequency, and you can see the signals are quite weak. They're nanoteslas or, and millivolts in the electric fields. The lowest frequencies that we need for long period MT come from activity on the sun. And when you have coronal mass ejections, we get large jumps in the Earth's magnetic field, and we call these magnetic storms. So this is now a 20 day recording, and you can see that there's a one day cycle as the Earth rotates in the solar wind. And during a magnetic storm, we often see one of the components is polarized, and you can get a jump, which is often several hundreds of nanotesla. So this is our low frequency signal. So let's kind of now just talk about the other processing steps. We've measured our time series. The first thing we do in processing is simply take a Fourier transform, because we want to get the electric field and magnetic field as a function of frequency. So we calculate the spectra. Then the next thing we do, remember, we divide the electric field by the magnetic field to get apparent resistivity. And this has the useful effect of removing information about the source. So this takes out any information arising from space physics or from lightning, and it focuses on the part of the EM field which is sensitive to Earth structure. So then we do this maybe 100 times at different stations. And then we go through an inversion. So an inversion is taking data and making a model of the Earth. And we now have techniques for doing this in MT in 1D, 2D, and 3D. And then right at the end, we'll talk a little bit about interpretation. So inversion. Inversion can be 1D, 2D, or 3D. And it's basically going from measured data to a model of the Earth. So the big difference between the Ford and the inverse problems is that the inverse problem is non-unique. That means there are multiple solutions and you have to undertake a reasonably careful way of evaluating your, your chosen model. I'm just going to show you a very simple example of inverting or modeling MT data. This is a sounding curve collected in Tibet in 1995 and what we can see is near the surface the resistivity is high and as we go to low frequencies we're moving to a lower resistivity. So in this case, the inversion is about as simple as it gets. We're going to manually change this model and we're going to see what the data fit looks like. So what we'll see is this misfit number is a judge of how good we're fit, how well we're fitting the data. So it's obvious we need two layers. We need to have a surface layer and a deeper layer. So if we increase the resistivity of our model everywhere, we see we're now fitting the high frequency data. That means the near surface part of the model is correct. But we need to put something in at depth to make the curve fit a little bit better. So if we do that, we've got a break at five kilometers. We can see that the misfits come down around 2.2. That's not bad. And we can keep going with that layer, 1.7, and get to a fairly good fit. But right at the end there, this is pretty common in empty data processing, we realize that there's no way we're going to fit this point. You can mathematically show that the apparent resistivity and the phase should be a smooth curve. So an outlier point like this has to be, has to be removed. That's a very simplistic but still valid illustration of the 1D inversion. Well, in 2D, there's a lot of programs out there, and in 3D, and I'm just going to illustrate how inversion works in, in this case. So this is our prisms model that we were looking at a few minutes ago. We've got these two prisms, a conductor and a resistor. So what I've done here is I've generated some data, I've added some noise, some Gaussian noise, and I've processed it using a standard inversion. And what we see is the inversion is recovering these targets, but you'll notice that the model has become smooth. It's smoother than the, the truth. And the reason we've done that is a lot of these inversions, if you put a lot of model parameters in, you need to have additional conditions to get a stable solution. And a very common one, not the only one, 
is to require your model to be smooth. Now, geology is sometimes smooth and sometimes it's not smooth. So this approach has to be used with caution. And what I'm gonna show you is a set of models here that illustrate the non-uniqueness. When you use one of these programs, you are at liberty to choose a parameter, which we call tau, which controls how smooth the model is going to be. And it's up to the user. The user can say, I want a smooth model or I want a rough model. And what we're gonna see is there is a trade-off. All of our solutions are gonna lie on this curve. And obviously we wanna get the misfit down as far as possible, but we're gonna see that getting a low misfit doesn't come without consequences. Sometimes a really low misfit is gonna require the model to become rough. And with the advent of these 2D inversions and 3D inversions are very similar, it's really important to consider this. So if we lower that parameter tau, we can see we're gonna get a much lower misfit. We're down to 1.4. And you'll notice the model is starting to look a little bit rougher. Well, we can kind of keep going. And you can kind of see here now, we're starting to pick up both the conductor and the resistor. Misfit's still coming down, but not really as much. So here we've got to a point, the misfit's pretty close to one statistically. And there's always people, I'm sure we know who they are, who would like to just make a rougher and rougher model. So what you can see in this part of the curve is each of these models is fitting the data just as well, but we're not really improving the fit. What we are doing is we're making the model rough and we're starting to introduce all manner of artifacts. So you can keep on with this process and you can kind of start to see now at this point, this statistically fits our, our data, but look at these artifacts that have arisen. You know, this here starts with like a fossil or a trilobite or something, isn't it? We've got all sorts of dipping conductors and I'm sure we can all think of people that might start interpreting these features, but they're pure artifacts. So whatever you're doing, whether it be 1D, 2D or 3D inversion, you never do one inversion and you really have to look very carefully at where is the trade-off? Where is the corner? This is the point at which we're not really getting a really big reduction in misfit anymore, but we're adding noise and artifacts. So just gonna sort of finish up the last part now and illustrate some examples of MT studies and also gonna to start to illustrate, you know, what are the structures we might see? So before we look at any places with tectonic activity, you know, plate boundaries, we're gonna review what might be a typical resistivity structure in the middle of a continent. So at the surface, sedimentary basins are usually low resistivity features because there is pore fluid sitting in the pore space between the rock grains. But the upper crust, if it's crystalline, igneous or metamorphic rocks, is typically in the thousands of ohm meters. The rock is dry, no charge carriers. The lower crust in many parts of the earth is really very different and has a very low resistivity. And this often starts at the brittle ductile transition. And two leading theories as to why the lower crust is conductive is either it's aqueous saline fluids in some small percentage, or it's perhaps some interconnected graphite films. And this debate's been going on for the better part of 30 years and I think really still has not really been answered. You know, there's good evidence from seismology that a low velocity in the lower crust requires fluids, but there's petrological arguments against that, but it's quite widely observed. The MOHO isn't always a large change in resistivity. It's a couple of places in, for example, in the Slave Crater where Alan Jones and colleagues have documented a very pronounced change in resistivity at the MOHO, but normally there isn't. And the upper mantle in the lithospheric upper mantle is usually more resistive than the lower crust. And seeing increases in resistivity is not well defined with MT. So upper mantle is generally, there are anomalies that we'll see in a minute, but it's usually well characterized as dry olivine, pyroxene, amphibole type minerals. And the resistivity is often controlled by the amount of hydrogen ions, by the amount of water dissolved in the olivine. The lithosphere or senosphere boundary is generally actually quite distinct in MT data. And there's debates about whether the seismological and the MT defined LAB are exactly in the same place. And the current ideas are still that the senosphere is low resistivity because of 
elevated temperatures, a small fraction of partial melt, or some other change in, in the mineralogy. So this is our typical model through the Earth. That's been based on quite a number of studies. So I'm going to talk through a number of examples now. And if I don't include one that you've done or someone's favorite, I apologize. I sat here yesterday really trying to cut this presentation down. But this is one that I think really stands out. Subduction zone studies with MT have been very, very successful. And this is one of the latest studies that's been done on the west coast of North America. And what we can kind of see here is a, a subducting plate coming down. And it is well imaged by the, excuse me a second, by the by seismic receiver functions and also by MT. So one of the earliest experiments was done here by um, in the MSLAB experiment in the 1980s. This is one of the more recent ones by, by Rob Evans, um, Shane McGarry and others, Phil Wanamaker. So what's interesting here is, no surprises, we're seeing low resistivity underneath the volcanic arc. Here's Mount Rainier. And the material is clearly rising up. But this inversion, they took an extra stage and imposed a discontinuity. So rather than smoothing this model everywhere, a discontinuity is allowed on the top of the Juan de Fuca plate. And when you do that, it really recovers much better the geometry of this low resistivity region. So here we are in the mantle wedge. And when you allow the model to have this discontinuity or a tear, you actually get the region of melting in the mantle wedge. It's, it's resolved really very well, very impressive. So this is a 2D study. All the rest of the studies I'm going to show you are 3D. So this is an example of a study of a volcano in the Andes. And this was by Matthew Como and other students in my group at the University of Alberta. And looking in the Andes, here's the volcanic arc in the central Andes. And in the back arc, there's this very intriguing volcano, Uturunku. And it's been known for quite a while from geodesy that this is lifting up about a centimeter per year over a very broad area of Bolivia and also subsiding in this ring in Argentina and Chile. So it's been inferred that perhaps this back arc volcanic structure is active despite not having eruptions for 270,000 years. So our work at Uturunku was part of an integrated NSF continental dynamics program with seismology, geodesy, petrology, and MT. And I'm showing here a couple of slices through a 3D model. So we had in excess of 200 stations down here. And these are slices through a 3D inversion model. And we identified a couple of regions that were potentially zones of magma accumulation. At the bottom was what had previously been labeled by seismologists, the Altiplano Puna magma body. And they'd inferred from surface wave tomography primarily that this was a very large region of partial melt, perhaps the largest melt body ever detected on Earth. Near the surface, at about sea level, there was another conductor. So after working with the petrologists, we had the idea that perhaps this was a zone of dacite melt, whereas this was basalt andesite melt sitting in this very, very large regional melt body. So in times gone by, it was very difficult to really advance interpretations on the basis of seeing low resistivity because we didn't have enough information about the causes of low resistivity in magmatic systems. But in this case, we were able to use the compilation of SIG melts and other experiments by Fabrice Gaillard and Michel Lemonnier to try and pin down a little bit more detail. If this is a layer of melt, well, exactly how much melt do we require? So I'm including this example because I think it shows quite clearly what you can do if you integrate petrology and use that to constrain your MT interpretation. So we're looking down here in the APMB. We know that from, from eruptive products, it's andesite. So 60% silica, thermobarometry gives us 980 centigrade and the pressure is assumed lithostatic. So this kind of gives us the range of melt resistivities that we might be looking at. And Again, looking at the erupted product, there's good evidence we've got between two and 3% sodium. And we've got perhaps quite a high water content, perhaps up to 7%. So this means we can pick out a point here and say that the melt 
is going to be somewhere in this region here. It's going to be a little bit below one ohmmeter. So the next stage is we want to calculate what amount of partial melt is required down here if it has this composition to explain the geophysics. So this band here, the orange band, is what we're measuring with the MT. And each of these curves is showing the bulk resistivity that you would get if you mix a melt of this composition with a crystal matrix that's at about 300 ohm meters. That's based on temperature. So again, we don't know really whether the melt is in isolated pores or whether it's actually in single in sheets that are really well connected. But where these curves intersect this band, you can see quite clearly that we're getting anywhere between five and maybe 50% melt. So this is a realistic explanation. It's quite possible to explain the properties of this region with a melt fraction that is probably at the moment not eruptible. Eruptible melt fractions really have to be over 50% to get a, a large eruption. Well, another example here comes from geothermal exploration. And MT is quite widely used as an exploration tool in the geothermal industry. And this is part of a 3D image at a volcano at a geothermal field at Darajat in Indonesia. And it shows kind of a number of features that I think are kind of significant trends for the future. Very common in geothermal fields to see a resistive layer of volcanic rocks. Then you see a low resistivity, which is a clay layer. And as the clay, the, the low resistivity is dominantly smectite. But as temperatures go up, you get a transition into illite and then perhaps into other metamorphic fasces. And actually the reservoir is quite often resistive. So this resistive conductive resistive sequence is quite common in geothermal fields. And you can use the place where the resistivity increases to understand you know, where the temperatures are going over 150 to 200 centigrade. And we have the advantage, of course, here with drilling, where there are measurements of, of temp subsurface temperature. So this is from a study by Wolfgang Sawyer and colleagues, which really I really like because it kind of shows not just what 3DMT can do, but also it integrates using seismic measurements, gravity, in what they call a multi-physics approach to really try and pin down the properties in a way that no one geophysical method can use. Well, just the final example I'm going to show is what's been happening on very large scale continental studies. So a number of countries now have these large grids of stations that cover entire continents. And in the US, this is the grid of stations as of 2018 collected by EarthScope. So you know, the group at Oregon State really take a lot of credit for moving this forward, Adam, Gary, and others. And this is now covering from coast to coast with a spacing of 70 kilometers. So once you start mapping out a whole continent, you really start to realize that there's interesting things in places perhaps where you didn't think there were, was going to be. So, you know, earlier MT studies were all focused on plate boundaries, or perhaps on the New Madrid seismic zone, or some other target. But now that we're getting continental scale co coverage, really interesting things come to light. So later in this sequence, I know we're going to have some presentations on this from, from those who've been working with this. And as well as collecting these huge grids of data, the other key part has been these 3D inversions. And I think one of the leading ones has, again, come from Oregon State. That's the code developed by Gary Egbert, Nasa Mebko, and Anna Kelbert, MODIM. So the availability of that code to many practitioners has been very much appreciated. Well, we haven't quite got a national grid in Canada, but we have in Alberta developed a reasonably coherent grid, at least in the southern half of the province. So I'm just going to finish by showing you a few slides of what these kind of models can show us. And this is based on an upcoming paper by, again, one of my students, Enzo Wong. So each of these dots is an MT station. And what I'm showing you here is a surface map of the 3D resistivity model and a series of east-west transects. So these low resistivities at the surface are the Western Canada sedimentary basin. And the area over here with high resistivities is the Canadian Cordillera. If you go look in the outcrop, these low and high resistivities match very well with the observed geology. So looking at an east-west transect here, here we can see in southern Alberta, the lithosphere is this high resistivity region. And the depth of the asthenosphere is somewhere about 200 kilometers. As you go beneath the Canadian Cordillera, 
you see a dramatic change because this region here has relatively thin lithosphere and the asthenosphere is present quite sh quite shallow depths. You'll notice here that within the lithosphere, we see a number of very low resistivity regions. And the more of these large grids that are collected, the more often we see this. And explaining the physical properties for these features is really a challenge. And in each case, you have to go through the possibilities. Could it be you know, some trace amount of graphite, or is it sulfides, or is it some other minerals like phlogopite, or is it anomalies in temperature? There's quite a few explanations. And to really advance the interpretation, you have to work forward using lab experiments, using other geophysics. So as we move north through this region, you'll see that the lithosphere is relatively constant in thickness. And we're getting, in this part, in central Alberta, there's really very little in the way of those mid-lithospheric conductors. So shown on the surface here, these are the boundaries of the, the Proterozoic terrains that formed North America. And what's really intriguing is sometimes when you don't see an anomaly, this is a thing called the snowbird tectonic zone, which is a Proterozoic suture or a Proterozoic subduction zone. It really has no resistivity expression in the lithosphere, which is really quite intriguing. As we move north, see a fairly similar feature. Northern Alberta has a couple of occurrences of, of, of diamonds and mining companies and others are interested in the mineral systems concept of often looking for deeper anomalies between surface expressions of mineralization. So the Buffalo Head Hills Kimberlite field is diamondiferous, but really has no anomaly in the lithosphere. Up at the Birch Mountains, a little bit to the north, there is indeed some feature, but I'll be the first to point out that our grid in northern Alberta is not as uniform as it is in the south. And this is primarily because of logistic reasons. But this is the first model we've been able to produce for Alberta, and it shows a number of features that are, are common to American and Australian programs, where you map the asthenosphere boundary and you see a number of very intriguing lithospheric conductors. So just to conclude, just a kind of a few summaries and conclusions, I, I think it's really been clear that the change in MT in the last decade to 20 years has been quite profound. Instruments are now much more reliable. We can collect much better data. And because the instruments are easier to use, we can now get very large grids that can really be used in 3D inversion. And it's been the advent of 3D inversion on clustered, on, on multiprocessor platforms that has really transformed this field. These new lab experiments have really helped us forward as well, because we can look at a resistivity anomaly and begin to understand what its cause is. And in a lot of cases, it's excluding possibilities, but that's kind of all part of that, that process. Joint inversions, as shown by that example from geothermal Indonesia, this is a really powerful tool as well. And more research is certainly ongoing in this area, you know, seismic and MT inversions and using gravity and using other, other types of data. And I've mainly focused in this talk on, on academic type geophysics, but there is kind of a real interest in, in using MT more in mineral exploration. Traditionally, if you're looking at structure one or two kilometers down, that's generally in mining too deep for it to be economic. But as the search for resources goes deeper in the earth, looking deeper and is going to be more significant and that's going to use MT. And in the mineral systems concept, what you're also doing is you're not just looking for the deposit at the surface, you're looking for the structures in the crust and mantle, which were pathways of ancient fluid flow, which led to the deposit. And a number of quite high profile examples of that in Australia and elsewhere where world-class mineral deposits are underlain by anomalies that go through the crust and into the mantle. So just to conclude, I would like to thank many of the colleagues I've worked with in EM Geophysics in, in 35 years, and Andy worked that out. I wasn't aware it had been quite so long. I'm not gonna put names down lest I forget anybody, but it's been a really great community. And a lot of these changes have come about through people being very generous and sharing their inversion and sharing the instrumentation that they've built. And through this new NSF pool that Andy's gonna talk about in a moment, it will be really great to see this, this broaden out that people who are interested in working in this field are able to come and contribute. So thank you very much for your attention. And just absolutely one final thing is if you wanna read some more, I would just point you to a few resources. I have been teaching a class in electromagnetic geophysics 
here in Canada for quite a while. My notes are online. If you'd like to get access to them, please, please send me an email. A couple of books, uh, Fiona Simpson and Carsten Barr's book from 2005, it's more of an undergrad introduction to MT. And for a graduate level and researcher book, a very thorough volume edited by Alan Chave and Alan Jones was published in 2012. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin. That was a wonderful overview. Um, and I already have a couple comments that I've received to that uh, end from the audience. Um, so just, uh, just wanted to encourage everybody, if you have questions, you can type them into the uh, question box now. I uh, already have a few that have uh, trickled in. And I'd like to take a moment uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, where Iris is going with MT and uh, what you can expect if you are a principal investigator, a scientist that is interested in using MT instruments that IRIS is uh, developing and, and procuring. So I'm gonna uh, show my screen now for a moment and put this in presentation mode. Okay, so uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Uh, so. Uh, just starting from the top, uh, the SAGE MT program is going to be centered from the Pascal Instrument Center. So that is in Socorro, New Mexico. It's affiliated with the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which is a, a research university in Socorro. Um, this is an effort that was uh, came out of uh, community interest in the last uh, proposal that went into NSF of facilities that should be operated on behalf of the scientific research community, MT. Uh, was recognized as something that the community wanted IRIS to uh, become more active in supporting. And so this is the direction that we're moving in. So you can see uh, a picture of the Pascal Instrument Center shown from above and a uh, picture, an inset of uh, the staff at Pascal uh, recent photo. These are people that uh, have different backgrounds from science to engineering, uh, to computer science and programming, to uh, uh, warehouse operations and uh, shipping logistics. So it's it's really a diverse group of people that uh, work on supporting scientific endeavors. So uh, just a picture of what the PIC looks like on the inside. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, uh, engineering labs and workspaces. In other cases, uh, as you see here, it's a warehouse that is a depot where thousands of different geophysical instruments are stored. Um, so many of these are seismometers and data loggers and other seismic equipment, but as I mentioned, we're, we're adding MT to this portfolio of uh, instrumentation. So uh, magnetotelerics is not a topic that IRIS uh, is unexperienced in. We partnered with, uh, as Martin mentioned, Oregon State University during a program sponsored by NSF called EarthScope to collect a survey of long period MT instruments across the United States. Uh, that was work uh, that was spearheaded uh, by Adam Schultz, uh, Gary Egbert, Brady Fry, and Anna Kelbert, and others at Oregon State. And it was an extremely successful effort. So the stations that are colored red are ones uh, that were collected up until uh, a couple of years ago. And since then, uh, that work was recognized as being uh, having some broad applications to understanding hazards to the electric grid and, and, other, um, and other subjects. So that work has continued. It's currently funded by NASA, uh, and it's working in uh, the southwestern US right now. And uh, we expect that to be continued with uh, support from the Department of the Interior over the next several years to fill out the rest of the, the US. Uh, and that work and the work that was done over uh, during Earthscope was uh, primarily uh, operated, uh, operated primarily uh, long period MT instruments called the NIMS. Uh, the NIMS uh, were, uh, did a lot for this effort, uh, but at this point they're 15 years old. And uh, as anybody that's operated instruments uh, knows that older instruments become uh, a little bit more difficult to use in many cases. So um, one of the uh, first issues that we're tackling under the SAGE facility is moving away to a more modern pool of instrumentation. The NIMS are still in play to do this uh, continental scale surveying, but uh, they are kind of best suited for specific applications by experienced users. So we're in our second year now, uh, just to give a quick update of where we are. Uh, we have a, a magnetotelluric engineer that's now hired and at the PIC, uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of David Goldack. And one of the first tasks that we've been working on uh, beyond just setting up a lab space and, and kind of getting uh, 
uh, a workflow set up for, for operating instruments is testing different electrode types that we will have as the, the electrode used or electrodes used by the facility. And so uh, that's work that's been both in the lab and it's now moved into the field. So these are pictures from a couple uh, weeks ago deploying both wideband and long period MT stations in the New Mexico desert uh, and a couple different uh, site uh, characteristics to understand the performance of the electrodes uh, in real field settings. And that's work that's been assisted by the USGS, uh, primarily Paul Bedrosian uh, at the Denver office. Uh, and then I mentioned the need to renew uh, and add instrumentation. So the first decision that we made was to replace uh, the long period MT capacity that we were able to have with the NIMS. And so we've uh, begun an initial procurement of about a dozen long period MT systems. These are uh, LEMIs out of a manufacturer in the Ukraine. Uh, they're very similar in characteristics to the NIMS. They're uh, very low power. They're strictly long periods. They use a single uh, MT instrument called a flux gate. And so we expect those instruments to be uh, in-house sometime uh, in the summer, and then they'll be available to PIs thereafter, uh, reservable through the Pascal Instrument Center's website. In addition, we are uh, going to be looking at procuring additional wideband and broadband MT instruments, and we're working with vendors uh, to identify a schedule to evaluate those sometime in the summer. So if you're a facility user, uh, what you should expect is that we will have new instruments available by the end of 2020, and that includes uh, at least a couple wideband or broadband MT systems in addition to the long period instruments I mentioned. Uh, the PIC uh, in its role as a facility will provide training, logistics, and data handling support if you are interested in actually uh, using the instrumentation uh, from the PIC to do some of your science. Uh, the data will need to be archived in a format called PH5, which is HDF5 uh, compatible, but that's uh, support that you will get from the PIC as part of uh, facilitating your experiment. And uh, we'll be exploring and working with the MT science community to uh, look at additional software resources for data processing. Uh, finally, something I just wanted to emphasize is that as a facility, as, a, as an operator of uh, resources that are used by researchers, we uh, take quite a bit of advice from the scientific community in terms of uh, how we manage uh, our resources and how we plan for um, the programs that we offer. And so I would encourage anyone, uh, you can obviously contact uh, uh, me, I'll have my information at the end of my slides. But if you're interested in providing feedback uh, to us through the MT community, I just wanted to uh, point out the names of the people that are currently on what's called our Electromagnetic Advisory Committee. So this is the governance structure that provides feedback. Uh, it also works with the Pascal Standing Committee, uh, which also oversees the, the general Pascal program. Um, but uh, this is one way to hear, have your voice heard and ensure that your needs as a researcher uh, are, um, are something that we can address and help you with. So just some future opportunities, things that I wanted to, to point out before the end of this webinar. Uh, we have a, a mailing list that provides information uh, very specific to the Pascal MT program. You can see the link here. I think if you just send a generic email to it, uh, you should get logged in and I can uh, make sure that that works. Uh, in addition, for uh, particularly for people that are in the US, uh, think about the new proposals that you might want to write and submit to the National Science Foundation. Or even if you have something funded, uh, MT is uh, generally can be a, a low, uh, low cost thing to add to your experiment uh, on top of uh, how many seismometers you might be putting out. So that's something that you could talk to me or talk to somebody at the Pascal Instrument Center about whether that might be an option for you if you're interested. Uh, in addition, we will have uh, a series of future webinars. Um, the next one is scheduled for Thursday, April 23rd. Uh, I'll send out an email a week or two in advance about it. And that's going to focus on science vignettes from different researchers in the MT community. So uh, Martin showed a wonderful uh, set of examples of science studies done with MT. And so this will be a little bit more uh, of that focused on different environments, different applications uh, from uh, several different users of MT uh, talking about their specific uh, science that they do.
Uh, in addition, we'll have future webinars on uh, various topics, field practices, data processing techniques, uh, and maybe deep dives, so specific research applications in different environments. But if there's something that you want to hear specifically, please uh, let us know. Uh, that's something where we want this webinar series to be as useful as it can be to uh, interested users. Um, we have a community workshop that's uh, still on the calendar for mid-August. Uh, We'll, we'll see what the, what the world situation is uh, later in the summer, but uh, if, it, if it proceeds, then we're planning to have a special interest group session at that workshop, which is going to be a hands-on with some of the new instrumentation that's being added to the Pascal Instrument Center, and that will include uh, magnetotelluric instrumentation. And finally, we're in the very initial stages of planning a uh, field and data processing short course that will be focused on collecting and then analyzing MT data that's likely to be held uh, in Socorro, New Mexico uh, at, at or near the Pascal Instrument Center. So uh, just sort of put that on your calendar for the very long term, uh, if you're, particularly if you're in the US and interested in, in being a new PI that submits exp uh, proposals to NSF or other uh, funding agencies to do MT research. So uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can ask them in the webinar or you can just send me an email and I'd be happy to write you back or give you a call sometime. So uh, I think with that, we can pivot back to Martin. And uh, Martin, I'm happy to go back to your screen since you might need that uh, for questions. Okay, and let me, okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start from the top. Um, and so the first question is from Devin Cohen and uh, Devin asked, do you like to invert your data as apparent resistivities or impedances? Uh, and what is your approach for assigning uncertainties? That, that's a good question. And we generally invert impedances, but we often do tests to see whether it, it makes a difference. So I think my grad students get kind of a little bit tired. You know, there's no such thing as a last inversion. You know, they do inversions and a big inversion on a cluster can take weeks. And then we see a few more things. We have to look at that. But Trying different approaches and seeing if you get the same answer is really, I, th I think, a good way to go. So we, I would say we focus on impedances, but we do, our codes are also set up to do apparent resistivity and phase. The question of uncertainties is another really good one. People often apply what we call an error flaw to the data in these inversions. And there are some people that don't like that. They say it's not respecting the precision of some data, but what it does is it, it sort of gives a, uni a more uniform coverage so maybe some points have very low uncertainties, but you don't want to just be fitting those at the penalty of others. So, yes, yeah, so I, I think, again, try a range of approaches would be my suggestion. Okay, uh, question from uh, Derek Shutt. Uh, he, actually, two questions. First question was, what are the logistical challenges of deploying in remote areas? Uh, and the second one is, uh, what do you think of methods that try to enforce common features between seismic and MT tomography, like cross gradient methods? Right. First one with logistics in remote areas, that that's fair, you know, depending on the systems you use. I mean, with MT, we really only need to have, you know, for long period, if there's good solar signals, and I, I could have mentioned a bit more that the long periods come and go in the 11 year sunspot cycle. And we've just been through the minimum when the signals are really quite, quite weak. So in a remote area, we, we really like to put the instrument in, go back after a week and check it, and then go after a month and pick it up. But if your access is by helicopter, that's gonna obviously double your budget. So we really kind of struggle with that. You know, some of the work we did last summer was broadband MT where we did have helicopter access. So you can get two or three of these instruments on a, on a typical medium sized helicopter. But like with seismics, you know, the logistics can be really the problem. Um, and what was the other, the other question? What was the other question, Andy? The other question was about imposing uh, cross gradient methods to resolve okay, uh, yeah. seismic tomography and MT. Yeah. So I think some of the real progress in this area has come from, there was a, was a method, it was produced by um, Gallardo and Max Meiju, and they use this cross gradient. So you're basically saying, you know, the big problem is joint inversion requires that we understand, you know, what is controlling the seismic velocity and the resistivity. 
And for example, if you have a system where it's, um, you know, the amount of pore fluid is controlling it, that will influence both. So if you add water, you're going to lower the resistivity, you're going to lower the velocity. But if you have a system where the amount of water is constant and the salinity is varying, that's only going to change the resistivity. It's not going to change the seismic. So the way that you couple together the different parameters in these joint inversions is really, is really critical. And the cross gradient approach, I think, is a robust one because that just simply says you want to have, you want to maximize the degree to which the changes are occurring in the same place. But, you know, as I just said, there are systems where the resistivity and the velocity are sensitive to really quite different parts of the system. So if you don't allow for that, a joint inversion is not going to be so successful. All right, thanks, Martin. Uh, next question is from Anusha Adara, and uh, Anusha was asking, what kind of instrument are you using for a 400 depth, uh, 400 kilometer depth information? That would be the longest period MT instruments. So again, the depth in MT is controlled by the skin depth, and getting to 400 kilometers requires not just measuring a low frequency, but also having quite a resistive environment so if your lithosphere is really resistive then you know typically we're seeing the asthenosphere at 200 kilometers in alberta at about 6,000 seconds so to be seeing down to 400 kilometers you need to have really quite high resistivities if you want to go deeper than that you have to kind of get into using you know observatory type instruments that will stay in place for even longer so for these low frequencies what's limiting you is the electric field so on a practical level, keeping electrodes working and cables not broken is, is quite a challenge. But even if you don't have mechanical or animal issues, the electrodes themselves can be quite unstable. So some of the most successful long period work has been done, certainly in Canada, uh, was one group, Alan Chave, Alan Jones, Adam Schultz, they put some instruments, put the electrodes into a lake that gave them thermal stability over a year. Other people, I know Rob Evans, Alan Jones, put marine instruments into Canadian lakes in the north, and that gave them, again, the thermal stability. So once you start getting to the really low frequencies, as the frequency becomes equal to the, you know, the one day period, 86,400 seconds, you start to get some non-plane wave effects, and you have to start getting into other types of analysis that recognize that it's no longer a plane wave. But that's, that's all been done, and just more data in those areas would be very helpful. All right, uh, next question is from Abone Sapato, and uh, Abone asks, what is, a, is there a good freeware for 1D or 2D synthetic modeling? Um, there's various packages out there, but they do not usually come in most people's idea of sort of freeware. So there's a couple of, I'm not gonna mention any commercial outfits around there. We have some, so Alan Jones's website that he runs, MTNet, has quite a reasonable list of, you know, freely available code. I know that um, on there you'll also find link. I know Kerry Key has been very good about making some of his, um, you know, one and two D and three D inversions available. So I would start by looking on at MTNet and looking on the Scripps website or contacting Kerry or Alan Jones. Both of those are people who know have have compiled stuff in the public domain. Okay, uh, next question is from Paulo Frieri. And uh, Paulo asks, can you talk a little bit about audio MT? Yeah, so I didn't mention that. I talked about AM, um, BBMT, broadband MT, and then long period. But if you actually are really interested in near surface, you can actually go and measure higher frequencies. So with AMT is so called, not because you can hear the signals, but because the frequencies are in the frequency band of our hearing. So typical, AMT goes up from one to 10 kilohertz. And for example, most commercial manufacturers will give you customized coils to work at those frequencies. Some systems like the, I said, you know, the new Phoenix system uses metal electrodes. So if you're really trying to maximize the number of stations that you deploy in a day, you know, digging the electrodes and the coils in is a large you know, amount of time and effort. So if you just put the metal electrodes in, with a spike that obviously kind of saves a lot of time and you can record just for an hour or two at each station. So it used to be at high frequencies, the coils were not very sensitive and a technique developed that's called CSAMT, controlled source audio magnetolurics. 
that's really kind of <coughs> it's still out there but it's kind of less used because the, the the amt systems are now a lot better so and again you can kind of use all the same effect all the same programs for in, inverting data in, in in 3d for amt that you could use for lower frequencies Okay, uh, next question is from Nick Williams. Uh, Nick writes, some MT or CSAMT surveys don't collect electric or magnetic fields at every station. They collect EX everywhere, <laughs> but only a few HY or vice versa. So what are the effects of undersampling one of the fields? That's a good question. So, you know, most studies show, you know, if, if you look at the surface of the Earth, there are variations in, say, magnetic permeability, but the variations in conductivity are by far the largest and most most widespread. So that's why this approach has arisen, whereby you measure the electric field everywhere, and to save time, you can actually get away with less magnetic field measurements. It, at a certain point, if you have very large contrasts in resistivity, that can actually start to produce some problems. But but again, you know, I think there's a number of studies out there where you can some of the programs, for example, will actually allow you to model what you're doing so for example in your program inversion program you specify where the electric field was measured <coughs> and where the magnetic field was measured so i don't think it's a huge effect i think it's something that people should be aware of that you know it's a shortcut and is potentially going to, to compromise some things but i think in a lot of cases it really doesn't have a huge effect but it's something to check if you're going to be doing that and relying that on your exploration strategy So a uh, question from Kasti Ahmed Sadiq, uh, who asked um, if you had any thoughts about seismo electromagnetic signal studies using MT. I haven't followed the literature on seismoelectrics for a while, and there's also electroseismic. So for people not familiar with that, this is where you generate a seismic wave, and when it hits a certain rock layer, it can generate piezoelectric signals which come to the surface. So I guess the electroseismic is kind of less of a less of an effect. I haven't worked in those fields, but I think in certain lithologies, certain types of explorations, you know, that's really interesting to try. Quite whether you could use standard MT instruments to do that, you know, I'm, I, I think a lot of adaptation would be needed because you need to obviously, it's, it's much more like a controlled source or, or time domain instrument because you're measuring at a very specific window in time. All right, uh, next question is from uh, Yiz Chi, and uh, Yiz asks uh, about uh, measuring EZ. Is, uh, is, is there information in EZ uh, that can be useful, and uh, why is it not more commonly measured? Well, again, there's a bit of an asymmetry when you're doing MT at the surface of the Earth. The Earth is, is quite conductive, and the atmosphere is very resistive. So right at the surface of the Earth, the vertical, the electric field is basically parallel to the surface. So people did try measuring the vertical electric field. I think the last paper I can think of was by Walter Jones and others in the, in the 80s. And because it's a weak signal, you've got to actually measure quite in, quite a, in, 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 a, in a shallow borehole. I'm not really sure that's worth revisiting at the moment to see if there's good information to be had from that. But you know, in, in, in the sea floor, you, you actually have, you can have quite a strong electric field because there isn't this resistive layer directly above your instrument. I mean, one other thing that happens with MT also is this whole question of, could you not do MT from an airborne platform? And, you know, there is a method out there called ZTEM, which basically measures the natural EM signals from a helicopter borne sensor that's only measuring the magnetic fields. Measuring the electric fields from a moving airborne platform is really still very, very difficult. But, you know, as some of these, you know, approaches to working, for example, on glacial ice or on resistive bedrock advance, then, you know, systems that can do that with antennas that are, you know, basically, you know, either inductively or capacitively coupled to the earth may have some, some advantage. Okay, uh, next question is from Mohammed Kashkuli, and Mohammed asks, uh, MT tends to exaggerate the base of conductors downward. In other words, make them thicker than they really are. How can we tackle that? Well, that's again, another good point. So, you know, I don't know how many times I've seen, you know, people who spend a lot of money on expensive processing packages and, you know, they don't seem to have 
appreciated the fact that it's the conductance that we're getting. So one example to, to overcome that is to include a tear in the model. So that example I showed from, from McGarry et al's cascade example, they were able to put a tear in because they knew where the tear was from seismology at the base of the conductor. And that gave a much more reliable image above. There are other types of inversions, you know, smooth inversions are not the only thing out there. Quite a few people have developed programs that will use more sharp bounds inversions. And in those cases, you specify a number of regions and the inversion focuses on moving the nodes that define those regions around rather than just solving for the conductivity in each cell. So I think the answer is if you have extra information either from well logs or from seismology, you can delineate the basis of conductors a lot more reliably and avoid this smearing downwards, which is, you know, an, an Martin, I think we might have lost you, or your audio at least. I'm back. I think there's a glitch in the audio, Andy. Yep, there you are. Okay. Yep, yep. you just yep. cut out for about 10 seconds. That's okay. Yep. Uh, did you want to uh, maybe just repeat the last uh, couple sentences you were saying? Yeah, I'm just saying about with the, the base of conductors. I, I, I think that the key thing is to recognize that, and it sounds like the questioner was obviously realized that's a problem. So using seismic constraints or other information to pin down where you think the base of the conductive layer is, that, that's kind of one of the most robust ways to, to address that problem, I think. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is from Nasruddin Bournas, uh, who asks, can fluxgate magnetometers be used to measure high frequency signals? That's again, another good question. So I didn't mention it, but you know, induction coils are actually only measuring the time derivative, you know, from their very definition. Flux gates have the advantage they measure absolute magnetic fields. And the neighbor magnetometers, we, we run ours at eight hertz. There are flux gates out there that will go to higher frequencies. And one of the problems comes is the noise that, that comes into those systems. Um, I had a student who worked previously at the University of Alberta building flux gates for space physics. And with some of those, we did look at, you know, terrestrial applications. So in principle, you can push flux gates to higher, to higher sample rates. You know, certainly the ones that Dave Miles, who's now at University of Iowa built, his were working up to hundred Hertz. Whether you could really get up to the kilohertz range, that, that's another challenge. You know, because what you have to balance is the, you know, the flux gate is driven by a, by a pulse frequency. So, they're really quite complicated devices, but in principle, there's, there's no reason why you couldn't certainly go to higher frequencies. And anyone that's used them, there's a lot less digging involved in flux gates than there are in induction coils. Okay, um, next question is from Prathul Patel, uh, who asks, if I only wanna focus on sediment thickness of an area, is 1D sufficient enough, or do I need to go to 2D? Um, there are those that would say, you know, if you've got a complicated geological environment, you know, you either do 1D or you do 3D. You know, a lot of the 1990s, I think, was really spent on two, when, when 2D inversion became practical. And the big question with that is, is what is the strike direction? You know, 2D, you're making this assumption that all your geology stretches off to infinity, you know, in two directions. And that's obviously highly unrealistic. So, there's absolutely value in 1D if you're just looking at base and thickness. You know, 2D inversions are, are, are quite widely available and, you know, certainly again would sort of provide a sort of, you know, an alternative view to what you would get with 1D. And even in 3D, I think, you know, the 3D codes are around now and, you know, as, as computers become faster, you know, you can, I know people that are running them even just on sort of, you know, large desktop workstations, you know, with a number of processors. So, by all means, 1D would probably work, but looking at a higher dimension would give you some extra information, I think. Okay, uh, question from uh, Raha Hafizi. Uh, how do we know what kind of MT we should apply to study at an area, 1D, 2D, or 3D? Well, there's another large field that I, I really couldn't get into today, and that is what we talk about dimensionality. And the thing with an individual MT measurement is because you're measuring the electric and magnetic fields in two directions, 
you actually have information about the azimuthal variation of the structure. So what that means is a single MT station, you can look at the different components of the electric field. And we look at something called the impedance tensor. And then from that, you can calculate something called the phase tensor. That's what tells us the dimensionality. So you can tell from one MT station if the structure below you is 1D, 2D, or 3D. And that certainly is one thing that we do. I think a lot of people today, just because they've got access to 3D codes, this stage gets, gets actually missed out. But actually sitting and looking at your data before you start up a 3D inversion to understand what are the structures that you're expecting is it's, it's still really important. And you know those tools again have been published in, in, in a number of places, but that, that's where I would start dimensionality analysis and you know primarily focused on things like the phase tensor is, is where I would go to answer that question. Okay, great. Um, this is a, a follow-up question to the first question that was asked by Devin Cohen. Um, and so I uh, wish I could remember exactly what Devin asked, but uh, if you, his comment is if you apply only a floor to off diagonal impedances, oh, this was uh, impedances. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you apply only a floor to off diagonal impedances, don't you prioritize fitting resistive structures at the expense of conductive structures? Yeah, you can you can go that way. I would have to. It's kind of hard to describe the various strategies that we use, but you do, as 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 the question is obviously aware, the impedance tensor has these two generally quite large off diagonal elements. If things are quasi two D, and the diagonal ones are smaller, but they're smaller, but they contain important information. So kind of a balance of how you you define the error floor, you know, is really important. So, so again, you know, I, I think there's been published in various papers. I'm trying to think of a good one that comes to mind, you know, which would actually tell us which of those equations would be the best. But again, you know, just just trying different strategies. You know, if you get an answer that you like and a model that kind of fits your geological prejudices, that's great. But you know, just just go through the questions of you know, what if I change this or what if I change this parameter? How is that going to change things? All right, thank you. Um, Abbas Fani has a question uh, just asking if you could explain a little bit more about uh, the use of phase data in the uh, MT uh, interpretation stage. Sure. So I didn't really talk about phase much in this talk because we only had an hour. But if you look at the apparent resistivity, is my screen on, um, Andy? It is, yeah. It is. Okay, I'm going down, for example, to this curve here. And if we look at the phase, in a simple 1D example or 2D, there's a very well-defined mathematical relationship between the two. So where the apparent resistivity is flat as a function of frequency, the phase is 45. Where it's dropping, the phase is above 45. Here it's flat again, it goes back to 45. So for 1D and 2D structures, there is a very well-linked relationship between apparent resistivity and phase. And you can actually use that in some ways to simply test the quality of your data. If you don't have this consistency, which comes through a Hilbert transform, then you know maybe there are problems with your data. This is not required in 3D. So if you're processing your data in 3D, you maybe don't want to use this test too, too carefully. But one of the things that the phase is, it is sensitive to the changes in apparent resistivity. So it has this preferential sensitivity to, to changes in structure. It's also very useful, again, we didn't talk about this, but one of the other big problems that comes in MT is you often have near surface structures which are small geometrically compared to your skin depth. And what that does is it changes the amplitude of your electric fields. And the reality then is that will push these resistivity curves up and down in what's called static shifts. And the problem with that is if you change the level of these curves and you're inverting the data, it will change the depth of structures. Phase is not affected by those effects. We call them galvanic. So the phase has this advantage that it's insensitive to the near surface structures. And I talked just now about something called the phase tense. That's a way of visualizing the phase in two directions. And there are people who've set up inversions in 3D to actually just invert the phase information. And they get the absolute resistivities from other weighted methods or from starting models or something like that. So 
absolutely the phase is really important and it can kind of give you another way of looking at your data that is less susceptible to problems with what we call galvanic effects. All right, uh, thanks, Martin. So um, there's a couple questions here that are more facility focused. So I'm happy to tackle sure. those. Maybe maybe yeah. allow you to get a breather for a second. Um, yeah. So uh, the question from David Koza. Uh, David is asking, what will happen to the old NIMS equipment? So that's a great question. Uh, so as I mentioned, the NIMS are about uh, a decade and a half old, but they're still very uh, high quality, viable instruments. The the data that they collect is uh, excellent, and so. Uh, one of the efforts that I alluded to in my slides is this continuing survey of the lower 48 U, uh, United States. So that's an effort that'll probably require an all hands on deck approach with both uh, the NIMS that, uh, that we hold, which are titled to the National Science Foundation, and uh, ones that Oregon State uh, has, in its, has in its inventory. So uh, likely those instruments will be tasked over the next several years in collecting and filling out uh, that array. And at that point, we'll probably reevaluate um, their status. Uh, beyond that, there was another question from Mark Goldie uh, asking about, um, will the MT gear be available for use outside the US, uh, i.e. Canada? Uh, the answer is yes. So uh, Iris, uh, Iris titled equipment, equipment operated by the, pa by the Pascal Instrument Center has been operated internationally on every continent uh, in just about every conceivable terrestrial environment. So uh, that's our hope that uh, MT goes far and wide uh, once those instruments are being used by researchers. Uh, one thing that we encourage is if that you're an international uh, researcher that's interested uh, in these instruments, one of the best avenues uh, for working, uh, working that angle is to find a domestic collaborator, somebody in, within the US that uh, might be a colleague of yours or, or might be some, someone you know and um, and collaborate with them on um, uh, writing a proposal that works uh, in your uh, in your area or in a region that you're both interested in. Uh, that's an, that's one of the opportunities where a lot of our instruments go abroad uh, for research use. Okay, so there's a handful of questions left, so uh, I think we can work through these in in uh, the time that we have. Um, so uh, there was a, a follow, or well, there was another question from Raha Hafizi who was asking, how do we know the direction of strike before starting MT to set the TE and TM modes? That again comes from a whole field called, you know, dimension analysis. So a couple of tools that are, that are out there for this. One is to, I guess in the 90s, 2000s, when we were doing a lot of 2D, there's techniques like gloom bailey decomposition. So you look at the MT tensor and you estimate from that which direction is the strike direction. And if you've got a whole set of stations, then that lets you kind of, you know, the, the statistics work a lot better. The, another approach is what's called the phase tensor. That's kind of a, a newer approach. And it's very much parallel. You know, you have a whole part of stations, you can kind of put them through a code and that will give you a strike direction. So the question is absolutely right. If we're doing 2D, this is the biggest challenge. You know, you really have to think about what is the strike direction because sometimes it's kind of, you know, we often we lay out a profile, you know, we work in an area, we think we understand the geology, we make some guesses about the strike and we deploy our stations at 90 degrees to that. And then we find that actually something else is going on. So it's really important to look at that really carefully. In 3D, you know, obviously you don't have to choose a strike direction, but these galvanic distortion effects are still there in 3D. And, you know, I, I think there are quite a few people who, who, you know, seem to not be aware of this. So sometimes what you'll find is the inversion will put small conductive structures around your stations that replicates or simulates the distortion. But again, just being aware of these effects, they can't always be represented. There are some nice inversions out there that I'm aware of where people are doing 3D inversions and they're also solving for the distortion at each station. So that, that's a very thorough approach and that's certainly research which is, is, is you know, is, is being quite productive. <laughs> 
Uh, next question is from uh, Piyush Chaudhary, and uh, Piyush asks, uh, what happens if induction coils and dipoles are not oriented in the north, south, and east, west directions? That's not really a problem. Most certainly commercial systems, when you start them up, you have to type into the spreadsheet, you know, what the orientation is. And there are sometimes good reasons for not doing that. You know, generally induction coils, you know, it's easy to put them in in you know the geographic system but quite often you know if you're working in a place that's forested or it's mountainous and you don't have a big flat field and you have to be a little bit creative it's not uncommon to have those you know the electric fields certainly at different angles so most processing packages would mathematically rotate them to geographic coordinate systems the main thing is to document it there's nothing worse than getting back and realizing someone's done this and not told you so as long as it's documented, most, most processing software allows you to, to, to handle that situation. Uh, next question is from Yildirim Gundaudu. Uh, and Yildirim asks, uh, there are a lot of stabilizer definitions such as total variation, minimum, grad minimum gradient stabilizer, uh, and so on. What are What is Martin's experience with different stabilizers? I presume the question's about smoothing in inversions. And I think that's right. There's, there's many, many different ways to smooth a model. You know, some people use kind of first derivative, second derivative, others require the model is close to an existing or starting model. And, and again, I, I, I really think with all of these inversion things, if there are different options there, try them and see if it makes a difference. So, you know, the thing with 2D and 3D inversions is, if you've got a data set and you run a pile of different inversions, you start to see after a while, you know, a set of features that are pretty robust, i.e. if you change a smoothing parameter or something else, you tend to get those features. If your model that you like requires a really specialized choice of parameters, that only that choice will produce, then maybe that's not a model to, to take quite so seriously. All right, uh, next question is from Xiaojian Chen. Um, and uh, Xiaojian asks, how could we deal with near surface anomalies when inverting 3D conductivity distribution of the deep earth, in which case it might require a multi-scale inversion? Absolutely. So another thing is I just said, you know, these small 3D near surface structures which cause galvanic distortion. One approach that some people have tried is to use another electromagnetic method, usually time domain EM, to measure it independently. And that approach certainly has, has some merits. You know, in geothermal exploration in countries such as Iceland, you have a problem that the near surface is incredibly variable in conductivity. So by having a external measurement of resistivity from a time domain system, that allows you in some ways to correct the data. But another approach is that you know some of the more recent inversions you know the older inversions all use a rectilinear grid which doesn't allow you to densify the grid around the station others that use more modern you know adaptive finite element programs or octree methods like that they let you have a really dense grid around your station and in between stations the grid size will increase so they really have the advantage that they can actually start to handle the complexity of the earth that that is that is there so again, you know, inversion software is, it's always developing and these new methods that are starting to address these problems are, are certainly the way forward, I think. Uh, next question is from Gonzalo Romero Beltran. Uh, and Gonzalo asks, in uh, Marine MT, how do you direct the, detect the direction of the magnetic field? Hey, Gonzalo. Um, so, most of the instruments do something like, you know, you, you drop the instrument to the seafloor and most of them use compasses. I, I believe that's what the current technique is. So the instrument, the seafloor has a compass, which tells you which way is, is north, south. Obviously, if you're dropping these things onto sort of mid-ocean ridges, which are magnetized basalts, then there may be some issues there. So I think there are some others that use, you know, I think people have tried to do things of, you know, using the transmitted signal which is polarized as a clue to the orientation. Others I think have used, they've said, okay, we don't know the orientation and that gets included in some, in certain controlled source EM, you can actually try and solve for the orientation. It just becomes another 
parameter in your inversion? So that's a kind of a good question because you don't actually go down there usually and place the instrument. All right, uh, questions from Sergio Espinosa uh, asking, is there a way to quantify the amount of reservoir fracturing and preferred orientation of fractures with MT data? Well, that maybe gets a little bit into anisotropy, and that's again something I didn't talk about. So there's a number of lithologies, and some would say the majority of cases, you know, I've talked about the resistivity so far being anisotropic. And in that case, that means the conduct, the resistivity varies in the X, Y, and Z direction. If you've got a fractured reservoir, that might well be a case where that would apply. So there are codes out there that can handle anisotropy. But, but again, when you start trying to invert for anisotropy, you've got three parameters or six parameters for each cell in your model. So that extra degree of complexity just um, doesn't help the non-uniqueness situation. So there are studies and, you know, for example, in fractured reservoirs, I was going to talk about this, but I left the slides out. You can actually start to get to look at time variations with MT. So the idea is, for example, if you were fracturing a material, you would do it, you would measure the MT response before and afterwards and see if you could see a response. It's quite a good example of this from a study in Australia by Jared Peacock a few years ago, where they were looking at injection in a geothermal field. And they were able to show in a fairly convincing way that there was a change in surface response associated with this. But if you remember, one of the challenges with doing this with MT is MT is measuring, it's measuring the average resistivity from the surface to the target. So if you've got a thin layer a kilometer down, then that can change a lot in terms of resistivity. What you'll measure is everything above that in an average. So even if your layer conductivity changes by 10, you, you're gonna see a very small change at the surface just because of the physics of MT. So that requires getting really accurate data. It might require recording for a long time. All right, a uh, question from uh, Dwebendu Sarkar uh, asking, um, it has been said that some Gaussian noises should be erased. Uh, can that happen in, a, in an area of complex topography like a uh, mountain range? Um, topography and noise, that's kind of a good sort of question. So in terms of you know, Gaussian and other noise, you know, the noise characteristics come in in several ways in MT. You know, one of them is in the time series processing where you have to use a statistical approach to get rid of that. But in terms of inversions, again, one of the things to look at is, you know, an inversion runs and a lot of people all they ever do is look at the misfit. They say, oh, the misfit's 1.3, that's wonderful. But it's the distribution of the residuals that is really important. And that can often tell you a lot about how you're fitting the data. So the residuals that are in there are important. And again, you know, if you're running one of these inversions, you know, this, the world seems to be divided into two groups. There's people that look at the model and there's people that look at the data fit. And I would really encourage people to say, look at both because there's information in both. Just because your misfit's low doesn't mean the model should be taken seriously. And just because the model matches the geology that you were expecting to see doesn't mean the fit is okay. So look at the data, misfit, not just one number, but actually look at the residuals and look at the model and together, I think there's something, you know, that's gonna give you a much more reliable approach. Topography, a lot of these modern inversions do include topography now, and the topography can actually distort the electric fields that you measure. Sometimes it's kind of this frequency independent galvanic effect that we were talking about just now. Other times it's more complicated, but one of the good things with these 3D inversions is most of them are now set up not just to model the topography of the stations, but to, to model the regional topography from a digital elevation map. And that, that largely overcomes these problems. But then again, a lot of the inversions are modeling the Earth as a series of cubes. And most mountains that I've ever seen actually have kind of smooth slopes. So again, just be aware that's a limitation. Okay, thanks, Martin. And I think as I, I see the clock approaching four o'clock, I think uh, at this point, maybe we'll we'll just answer the questions that we've received through this point. I still have uh, five or six to get through. Uh, okay. But if you have any other questions, uh, please either uh, send those to me or I can pass those along to Martin. Um, and uh, as I said, this webinar will be will be uh, posted uh, soon.
So um, question from Azhar Fikri, um, who asks, what can we analyze from TE or TM inversion modes separately? Well, the two, if you're working with those two modes, the TE is generally most sensitive to conductors. And that's because additional current is induced to flow in the conductor. The TM mode, because the current flows across, you get surface charges. It tends to be more sensitive to the resistors. You know, you will see the conductors. So obviously, if you're trying to get a complete image of the subsurface, you need to invert both of them. But when you start working with real data, one of the effects is that you might have a long conductor. You know, it could be some ore body or it could be some basin. The effects of the ends can actually make things very 3D. So I've seen quite a number of times, and it's in the literature, that if you have a profile going across, for example, a sedimentary basin, the TM mode will be quite reliable because the TM mode is reproducing already the physics of electric flow across boundaries. The TE mode doesn't reproduce that in 2D, and it's not uncommon to see end effects from basins in the TE mode, and a 2D inversion simply can't model those. So again, be kind of cautious. If you have the, the resources to sort of even run some small coarse gridded 3D inversions, that would, that would be kind of a good way to go, I think. All right, uh, question from uh, Tule Ekin. Um, how can crustal lithospheric scale anisotropic knowledge uh, be inferred from seismic observations and models constrained by MT data and models? So seismic, uh, well, MT anisotropy, that's kind of a good question. There's quite a literature that I think it's clear that a lot of rocks are anisotropic electrically, but when you start looking at an array of MT data, it's not always a unique association. You can't look at certain effects can be produced by you know, what we would call macro anisotropy. So a series of large regional scale conductors. You would get very similar effects from a material which is inherently anisotropic. So uniquely saying that a, a region is anisotropic is still quite challenging. You have to be quite careful. There are a few convincing examples out there. I'm not going to say any names on, 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 online of, of, of papers where people have very rigorously modeled data and shown that there is indeed anisotropy present. You know, but there's always this complex interaction. Once you're getting into 3D, a lot of the effects in 3D can look very like effects of anisotropy. So you kind of have to be careful how you do that. Obviously, a key thing would be having some information about if you've got lithological measurements that would tell you, you know, from boreholes or from samples you've collected, that's another clue that things might be anisotropic. All right, uh, question from Ved Moria. Um, what is required to take care of for modeling broadband MT stations over both land and ocean simultaneously? Well, one thing with MT is you don't actually have to have all the data collect. Unlike seismology, most seismic surveys, you need to have the array deployed so that you measure the same earthquakes. But with MT, you don't actually have to deploy everything at the same time. So for getting good responses, it's important to have multiple instruments running at once. And that lets you do something called remote reference processing, <coughs> which allows you to separate signal from noise. So with onshore and offshore, it's not uncommon for these to occur at different times. And the data can be combined in all of the inversions because the whole processing sequence we use in MT is basically saying we're taking out information about the source. When we make that calculation of electric over magnetic fields, we're removing information about the absolute signal strength. And what remains is information that is characteristic of the Earth. So onshore, offshore, you don't have to do it at once. You can do it in separate campaigns. All right, a question from Anna Pastoresa, um, who asks, what is the attenuation of the MT field in the horizontal direction? Is it possible to calculate a horizontal skin depth? Well, that's another good question. That, 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 that analogy, that figure I showed that I'm just going back to here, you'll notice I put kind of this hemisphere. By doing that, I'm not really implying that the signal's traveling horizontally. It's rather, you know, at your measurement point, remember it's a plane wave that's coming down on the earth. So 
what I'm sort of trying to show here is if you're making your measurement here, you are sensitive to a volume laterally. So in MT, we get these electric currents flowing, which are horizontal, and they don't really attenuate in a horizontal distance if it's a plane wave. If you had a boundary, oh, let's just try to find an example. For example, in 2D, if we go over to the, the prism model, then obviously what we can see here is there's an effect at which you see the anomaly of the prism right above where the prism is located. If you go off to one side, you don't see it. So when you model the EM fields in two dimensions, absolutely the skin depth kind of is applying here, you know, for, for signals traveling in, in, in the earth. We there, Andy? I'm good now. Yep, yep. no, I'm here. Um, all right, uh, so question from Yiz Chi. Uh, who asks, uh, in geothermal studies, smectite changes to illite as temperature goes up. Will it change back when the temperature cools down? Well, that's another good question. One of the, one of the challenges, I, I guess the answer is not always. And, you know, one of the problems with those strategies in MT exploration is people used to use DC resistivity a lot to locate the clay cap. And... That's all well and good, but the problem is if you have a shut off of the heat supply, then the reservoir goes away, but your smectite layer will stay there for quite a while. So finding a conductive clay cap is no guarantee that there is a reservoir underneath. You know, I guess you could say that it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. So a certain approach I've seen a number of geothermal companies use in geothermal is to you map out the clay cap with MT so you can get an area. And then they use a selective drilling program to try and estimate the temperature and volume of the reservoir below. And then they can start to do their thermal calculations in terms of the resource. So absolutely, there's a, just because you find a clay cap does not mean that there is a, a reservoir below. And there's also cases in the literature where people have detected, you know, there's other things in a, in a geothermal region that may not be geothermal. And you know, certainly in a lot of areas, you know, always think of the other possibilities, you know, sulfide, minerals, graphite, other things like that, and can always be present. Just because you see a conductor does not mean it's hot water. All right, uh, another question from Yuz Chi. Uh, is the easy uh, vertical component measurement uh, in marine MT very common or useful? Um, I would have to defer that to, to someone like Kerry or someone else. I don't think it is. I'm just trying to think of instruments that I've seen. There's certainly value in measuring that component of the field, but it's not the, not the most widely used, no. All right. Uh... So a uh, question from Jan Avram. Uh, we see more and more research conducted toward development of new time series processing codes. While these codes have various ways of calculating the MT response, we can we see improvements in data depending on codes used and environments where data were, where data were collected? Hi, Jan. That's a good question from, from you. Um, I guess I often look back and look at, you know, the volume of data that we're collecting now. And I, I you know, the, the modern systems collect, you know, gigabytes of data. So I occasionally look back at old data from 20 years ago when we, everything had to fit on a 1.4 megabyte floppy. And I don't think there's been a thousand fold increase in that. But I think where a lot of these systems are going is, as anyone who's done MT realizes, as society develops, there's always more power lines, there's always more sources of noise. And simply trying to find a place where you can actually measure these natural signals is becoming a challenge. You know, China is one of the biggest users of MT and several of my colleagues there have been to certain field areas a number of times and they've made decisions to say, right, we have to make this measurement now because if we wait till next year, there's gonna be a high speed train here. So I think that's the biggest change in time series processing and acquisition is dealing with noise. And having a second station away from the noise can help, but noise just becomes so prevalent. So it's, it's, it's kind of a tough decision. I'm, I think there were still areas for improvement in that, 
the code we use quite a lot, like a lot of other people use robust statistics. And what that simply means is if you just average your data to try and get a good estimate, that doesn't work because it gets biased by very strong samples of noise. Whereas the robust method is looking statistically and trying to make your data have a Gaussian distribution in terms of the residual. So I think more research is needed. Exactly what approaches would work is a good question, but having a raise of instruments, I think is kind of one of the, one of the keys here. Okay, uh, great. Um, so to follow up on the marine uh, vertical electric field question, uh, Kerry was yeah. uh, still here and he uh, mentions that it's not used in any examples he knows of for marine MT, but it is for controlled source EM. Yeah. Okay, now that's good. Thanks very much for that, Kerry. Uh, okay, um, so just a couple questions left uh, from Raha Hafizi uh, asked, uh, uh, how just by looking at time series can we distinguish noise? That's a really good question. I would say when you've looked at MT time series quite a lot, there are certain things that stand out and other times the signals do not look that distinct. So first pass will be to look at a correlation. You should see a correlation between electric and magnetic. So if your noise is purely electric or purely magnetic, you won't see a correlation between channels. But if your noise is electromagnetic, it will show up in all channels. So having multiple stations is the key here. And ideally one of them is far away from your survey area so that you are hopefully out of the range of any power lines or water pumps or trains or things like that. So again, multiple stations, I think is the answer here. Okay, um, and so the last two questions uh, are from Zakaria Bukalfa. Um, the first one's a technical question and it's, uh, is there any relation between the strike that you have in uh, the uh, MT or EM data and the geological direction that you can often observe from a geologic map? Well, if, if, if things work out, I, I, I wouldn't wanna put a percentage on the times that this correlates. Quite often, I would say we do see a strike, you know, if you're working in a, ma a major mountain range, you know, such as in the Cascades or the Andes, you know, I would say it's not uncommon that we see a strike that's within 10 or 20 degrees of what we expect. But there are cases where that's not the case. So another thing that comes out of the strike angle determination from certain impedances is there is this 90 degree ambiguity. So you can say the strike is north 45 degrees east, but it could be north 45 degrees west. And in that case, often you do have to resort to other information and the geology map is sometimes one of them. So I would say generally our experience has been in, in, a, in a simple environment. You see an agreement between the geoelectric strike and the geological strike, but it's not uncommon to see serious discrepancies. And as you get into 3D environments, you know the whole idea of strike applying to a whole data set starts to break down and you know you don't see a correlation but again always looking for external information to to, to ground truth what you're looking for is is, is, is the way to go here mm -hmm. okay uh and then the last question was uh if you had any uh thoughts or recommendations for uh for foreign students looking for internships or other uh educational opportunities in mt that's a good question and i get quite a few people contacting me um, I think by all means kind of, you know, contact professors and, you know, to, to, to see what the openings are, you know, I think also just kind of really, you know, being aware of the, the, you know, the application cycle and schedule that we kind of have. So for example, you know, most North American universities are recruit for September and we're doing that, you know, we start the year before, you know, in the, in the fall. So giving kind of, you know, applications in advance. Funding has become more of an issue. I can certainly say that's been a case in Canada. You know, the money we have to support overseas students is from the Canadian side is, is quite limited. So if, if there's a way that you can get a scholarship in your country that lets you study abroad, that that that, that really helps things. You know, we can provide technical training and, and help, but it's becoming increasingly difficult in a lot of cases to actually provide scholarships. But I'm always interested to hear from people who are interested to study. So I, I think that's a you know, that's a very, been a very fruitful direction in the past, and I hope we can continue that. 
All right. Well, Martin, uh, thank you so much again for that uh, that wonderful overview and for sticking around. I think this was the longest Q&A session uh, that we've ever had on an IRIS webinar. Um, that was uh, a lot of questions, a lot of very engaged questions from the audience. I think we still have about 120 people here um, down from 250 at the peak. So, um, so that was great. So thank you again so much, Martin. Um, this has been recorded. I'm going to uh, end the recording right now.